All right, here we are. We are back on Seeking Wisdom, and I have a special, special guest. I'm a little shy today because I'm in awe of this guest. Her name is Rebecca Messina. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I said I should get your autograph. No way. I'm going to give the audience uh, your background because it's so extensive and embarrassing. So I'm going to embarrass you now. So now you have okay. to sit there and be embarrassed. All right, right? I'll be embarrassed. All right. So Rebecca has is a global citizen. She's worked in four continents. She speaks four languages. I can barely speak English, so we're going to have to dig into that. And uh, she was Uber's first ever chief marketing officer. And, she, and we're going to dive into that. But before joining Uber, she was at global CMO of Beam Suntory. I hope I said that right. Mm, you did. And, <laughs> nice. And they own lots of things. If you like to drink, Jim Beam, right. Maker's Mark, uh, and other brands, uh, we can dive into that. And then she spent a long time in uh, Coca-Cola, which I'm fascinated back. And she's bought back in Atlanta right now. And so we're going to dive into that and what she's up to now as a senior advisor at McKinsey. She's super fancy, the fanciest Very fancy. of the fancy. <laughs> but, uh, but before we started this episode, Rebecca and I were talking about Duff's Buffalo, Chevetta Chicken, and uh, sneaking into Canada. That's right. All, all that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you grow up? I grew up in the Bronx, as we know. As we know, I grew up in a very small town called Batavia, New York. It's about 30 minutes between Buffalo and Rochester. So I never tell people from Batavia because they wouldn't know where it was. Mm -hmm. Do you know where Brant is? I don't. Oh, that's up there too. Oh, geez. I have yeah, to get even better smaller, with my I Western think. New York geography. Yeah. So how did you find your way out of Buffalo? Yeah, you know, What's it's funny. Story? I had these parents that were super you know we were super middle class and mm -hmm. they always kept us connected to place if you would and i say that because italy was a really important place for my family mm -hmm. and you know a lot of italian immigrants are up in that part of, of new york yeah, state and time. i would my family would be in that in that category and so i kind of when i started to think about where i was going to go to school to college i really didn't have a job in mind i had this odd idea that i was going to be a global citizen <laughs> and so I started to think of my parents, like, what does one do when they do that? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe I'll be in the Peace Corps. Maybe I'll teach Spanish, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. My, I had a lot of uh, Italian language in my life. And so I kind of grew up with a little bit of an ear for language or desire, maybe not even an ear. I just mm -hmm. was the one, one in the family who really loved that. And then I um, came time to go to college. I wanted to go far. So I actually, well, that's not completely true. Why is true. that? Why did you want to go far? Well, it's not completely true. One little story. It, it, I feel like... Yeah. Uh, Julia Roberts. So um, I really wanted to go to Notre Dame. Mm. Okay. And I didn't get accepted to Notre Dame. And so every once in a while, I feel like I should go back like Julia Roberts when she went back in with the bags and was like, yeah, hey, yeah. mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit how I feel. So I didn't get into my first choice. Mm -hmm. And I had um, three backups, actually one in Massachusetts, Miami of Ohio and Syracuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I enrolled in Syracuse and, and amazing university. But then I got sort of cold feet because it was so close to home. Yeah. Too, too close. close to home. And so my mom's like, you really should think about this school that my brother went to, my, my uncle. And so off I went to Miami and it turned out to be great. And indeed I studied, you know, I was diplomacy and foreign affairs and a uh, double language with majors, or sorry, double major with two languages. And um, that's how it started. Wow, that's am amazing how you had that foresight to yeah. do that. And it's super impressive. I did not know anything. I did not barely know how to go to college. I didn't know, know what a major was. I didn't even know. I mean, it, you know, I always tell people it's such a different time before the internet. Like everyone has access to everything. I didn't know how to do anything, right? Like I didn't know how like you could travel abroad. I didn't know how any of that stuff when I was kind of in high school age. And so it took a long time to learn that stuff. Now everyone knows everything through Instagram. It's and so true. Well. So yeah. true. And you know, we have to actually write postcards to home then. Yeah, you know, and I actually did. I wrote them, and then they get it a week later, and you get one a week later, and it was Think how. Think about it went. that. Think about you traveling, being away now, uh, for people who have kids, and there's no cell phone, and you only get postcards in the mail. And, and you <laughs> use, you know, you used what are those phones called? I don't even know what they're called anymore. Pay phones. Pay phones. Yes. Yeah. Pay phones, and you have quarters. And, and you had quarters, and you then, and then I used to have to call collect because I was calling from another country. <laughs> And you remember the lady would come on and yeah. would you accept a collect call from Rebecca and all yeah. that? Yeah, it was wild, wild times. It's incredible. How did you go from studying, being this kind of global citizen, this kind of idea that you had? I wish I had that idea. I'm only having it now. And then Never go into the world of marketing. Like, how yeah. did you go? What was your professional? You know, it's funny. Training? Marketing at the end of the day is about people. So I'm yeah. well, I'm well suited for that, you know, in my personality and actually 
if you do want to see the world, there's probably no better conduit to do so than, than business. And so when I started getting, now it's like, okay, crap, I really have to think about what I'm going to do with my life. I really just targeted global companies. And in the 90s, you were still thinking about careers probably differently than people of the same age are thinking about them today. Yeah. So I was thinking these big global companies, you know, Delta, UPS, Home Depot, Coke. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really fortunate that I got a connection with someone at Coke and they at least offered to talk to me. They, there was no formal internship program. Mm -hmm. There was no way to come in kind of as an undergrad, out of undergrad. And I went in and I um, interviewed with a, was a Scott McTeon, a really good friend of mine, one of my best friends now. And they were able to figure out kind of a, made an internship for me. And it was just a three month internship. All my friends are leaving college and have jobs and I'm like going off to be an intern. <laughs> and three months turned into 22 years. So it was a, wow. and it over delivered on my global citizen. You know, I was a few years in and I graduated college in 94 and 99, I was living in Santiago, Chile. <sighs> and, um, and then I moved from Chile to Australia. Then I moved from Australia to France. I had this just great experience with them and I had so many different opportunities and jobs and you know to be a female in Latin America in the late 90s oh, yeah. is fascinating and um, really yeah, cool. Fascinating is the right word. <laughs> yeah, sure. so it was just an amazing experience. That's crazy. So I love one thing that you said, which I harp on all the time, and especially in the world that we're in, which is that marketing is about people and understanding people, because I think the people that I talk to who are in marketing functions today are mostly digital marketers, yeah. and they come from that background, and they're yeah. so focused on channels and optimizations and you know tools and stuff, and they forget the fundamental thing about people. So I'd love to talk more about that. Yeah, certainly. Like, and yeah, and what's interesting, you do an amazing job with your teams because you bring in folks like me who mm -hmm. I don't know as much about B2B, certainly I know a lot about digital marketing, but you kind of seek, you're seeking this more fundamental brand building mindset mm -hmm. that I do think I was lucky to have at Coke, you know, and an Uber story on this, actually, when I was interviewing to go to Uber, I started Googling Uber, and um, this is a telling story about exactly what you're, you're saying is, yeah. in, up on the page, and I took a screenshot of it, um, mm -hmm. was only all you saw were hands and a phone. Mm. And I thought, okay, this is 2018. The Thanks. brand is well embedded in our lives. How is it? And it's, I think what you said is because it became an idea that was so centered around tech mm. and then it forgot that it was centered around people formerly mm -hmm. and drivers, you know, hundreds of millions of rides every day, bringing two strangers together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it was people were running this, empowering this, but and, and that was kind of a little bit why I was able to go there because I, I kind of just brought a different sensitivity, if you would, yeah. that you have if you kind of were raised in more of a CPG or a mm -hmm. mindset around brand building in a more fundamental way. It's crazy. I mean, you hit on one of the things that drives me the, the crazy, like one of my <laughs> things, that, which is like designers and then the marketers that work with them for websites and, and collateral, they had some weird obsession with taking pictures of hands, no yes. faces, you know, like anonymous, yes. like body parts. And it's like, no, it's all about faces. People want to connect to people, yes. real people, like yes. look at eyes, you know, yeah, like, like a window into their soul a little, totally. and, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then you lose humanity without it. And, and so I think it's more important than ever as we've moved to this heavily measured, heavily digital transactional world. Sure. It's wonderful. It's brought more tools than ever to marketing. We are, yeah. it's a golden era in many ways, but at the same time, it, we, we're still an inspired discipline. Yeah, the, you know, so if you're a marketer, if you're a designer listening to this, stop taking pictures of hands, stop taking, taking pictures of the back of people's heads, stop, take pictures of real people, right? That's real right. eyes and things like that. That's right. But one thing that you, you know, one thing that's amazing about your background, which is like, I think like, you know, things are cyclical, you always come back. And when we started Drift, I was obsessed with studying brand building and understanding mm -hmm. brand building because I think we had over rotated so hard on digital everything, track everything. And, you know, in terms of competition, in terms of how many alternatives there were, there are in the market, we were moving towards a world where everything, all of technology, all products were move, were looking more like CPG, mm -hmm. right? In terms of being able to build, having to build a brand, having to build affinity, having to do those things yeah. and less to do with the early days of technology when you could just compete on technology. On utility you know. and like newness yeah. and yeah. Totally. It's so true. And you know, I feel lucky that I kind of, I feel like I lived in two centuries in marketing and I did, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you to did. be raised in the 20th century when brands were manufacture brands, right? And that's not a bad thing, but what, what can we make? Mm -hmm. and, and, let's, and then we'll push it out to the world and we'll sell it. 
And I think what's so fascinating about the 21st century is it's really more about what can the, what, how can we put the outside world together and create something entirely mm -hmm. new? You know, and I think to, to live in these two worlds, but to see how um, brand building has a very different meaning. As a matter of fact, the four letter word, word as you know it sometimes in, in, yeah. in tech, you know? Mm -hmm. And I worked really hard in my early days, especially at Uber to ensure that I, I, I had to almost undo some of the things, the conventions mm -hmm. of brand building and really work on language that could connect with more of an engineering mindset. So instead of talking about maybe brand building, I would talk about creating meaning or, yep. you know, it just, it's just, just another way of bringing in the same idea, but in a way that maybe people could hear it who might have not been raised, if you would, the same way mm -hmm. I was on, on building brands. It's funny. I always, you don't know this, but I always talk about these three eras of marketing. And I feel like that I've lived through so far. The first era being the brand era, which you were yep. talking about, right? That, that, that real focus on building brand. The second being this started in the early 2000s, which was the digital yep. transformation, right? It's the demand generation era. It's all about leads, all about capture, yep. all about, you know, tools and utility. And I think we're now entering this other one, which, you know, goes back a little bit to brand, which is how do you build these long-term relationships That's with right. people? Because everything now is not transactional, like in the brand era, meaning like we sell th something to you once. It's all about long-term lasting relationships, you know, brought on by, right. you know, subscription, everything, but also yeah. brought on by, you know, the way that we buy and shop today. It's really true. And I, it's, and I actually, it's a welcome moment, if you would, mm -hmm. because it kind of brings the best of back together Total. Yeah. and it puts back at the center what should have always been there. Mm -hmm. But it also requires us as marketers inside the org to connect in ways that maybe, I think we've, we've kind of let this divide happen. And I think uh, a lot of the work I do advising companies and things is really helping CMOs kind of unify the C-suite or unify the teams. And, and they may not be, you know, in CPG, you kind of, you make your products, right? Yep. You are designing mm -hmm. the innovation pipeline and you, kind of live the whole life cycle, if you would, of the business. You don't typically in tech brands, but that doesn't mean you can't get closer to it. It's, I always say, you don't have to unify the structure, you just need to unify the process mm -hmm. so that these inputs are there that right now are being really brought in very late. And when you bring marketing in late, you often bring the consumer in late. And, and that's how we kind of miss out sometimes. Mm. Amen, I love it, Rebecca. <laughs> how did, what was the training like? Like in the early days of going to Coca-Cola, like. How did you train as a marketer? Like, you know, many people listening to this only know the digital, you know, the yeah. generation era. So they, they don't know anything about brand building. Yeah, well, I was lucky because, like I said, Coke didn't have any formal intern program and I didn't kind of come in the normal way. And often Coke then, I don't know if what's true now, if somebody from Coke's listening, maybe they know in the last few years if it's changed, mm -hmm. but Coke tended to not hire entry level marketers. It had sort of a, its strategy, I think HR would have even said this, was really we will buy great marketers from P&G and Unilever yeah. and those companies. And it was really Sergio Zeman, to his credit, he was the, the chief marketing officer when I joined in 94, but he started this huge program about bringing in talent. There was a name for it, I don't remember, it had some acronym. Anyway, it was, so he brought in this great talent and I, you just, you got thrown into these jobs that were bigger than you, oh, right? And it was, it was like always, and I do, even now, as I lead, I try to always get, I've always, people will live into those moments. Mm -hmm. They typically kind of rise up, you know? And so I was just lucky like that to think that at 28 years old, I'm living in Latin America and running marketing uh, communications for four countries. And it just was kind of a nutty. So I learned by doing it in a, a large way and learned mm -hmm. by working with some of the best marketers I could have ever worked with and have just been given really great opportunities. And um, and what I think helped me a lot was I did so many different jobs from so many different angles and it really prepared me for like a world of Uber or even a world of spirits because I had to learn how to talk about what I knew in so many different contexts. And, and I'm really grateful I got to do that. You know, I had to learn how to show up in a foreign country and explain things. And I had to mm -hmm. learn French on the fly because yeah. I didn't know French when I moved to France and that was really, really hard. And. Um, and then I learned marketing from single country view where we, you know, mm -hmm. full ownership of the P&L. And then I saw marketing from a group view where you kind of were connecting the dots across Europe, for example. Saw marketing from a global view. Um, saw marketing from the incubator, the small brands and the big brands. And so that was just really helpful. And so people are like, how'd you stay there so long? And I'm like, because every job was- Endless learning new, opportunities, yeah, right? Endless, mm -hmm. endless. It was- you know, it was like working at the United Nations every day and really working on really great things. But it was a company that believed in marketing and believed in yep. brand building. Mm -hmm. um, and, and 
it taught me just some fundamentals that I will be forever grateful. Isn't Coca-Cola the still the number one brand? Like from no, the no, no, is it? it isn't. Now it's been overtaken by your Googles and your Apples. Wow, remember, really? Yeah, yeah. So, and we kind of knew that. I remember wow. having meetings around when Interbrand would come out with it, and our our mm -hmm. CMO at the time, Joe Tripodi, to his credit, he called it. He said, "We won't be on this list ten years from now um, mm. because of the utilitarian nature of a brand like." Google, it's, it, you know, it's a verb in your life, right? Yes. Uber, okay. Mm -hmm. Those brands. So it's more because you, part of what, how that ranking happens is awareness is mm -hmm. these brands are all hundred percent awareness, all the ones that are in the top, you know, 97% yeah. awareness brands, but, mm -hmm. but a brand like Coke is got really almost, um, high virtual brand love, if you would. Yep. And, um, some of these have really high product love and there's a bit of a difference that we could probably talk about mm -hmm. but they become well known in our lives um you, but they, you know do you did you find sorry to interrupt you did you find that i love the way that you learned at coke and i think that's the way i've learned of just like you know you, you're getting you're in the deep end of the pool right. you're forced to learn like you survive and you thrive and it's not always it's not comfortable right because you're right. always on the fly and going did you see a lot of people not make it through that process because i asked because i think a lot of times now when I'm talking to people younger in their career, they seem to want these, they want the growth, but they don't want the discomfort. They don't want to, Love that. And, yeah. That's a really good way of putting it. I think, I mean, you're an entrepreneur, so you're in another, you're in another class of people who are, can handle the discomfort. Yeah. But I do like white space. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of always said, you know, I, I found value to create. I didn't always follow the job description. And, um, mm. and entrepreneurs, you didn't even have a job description. So you take the structure <laughs> out altogether. Yeah. I'm given a little bit of structure and be like, okay, so you sort of want me to hear. And then I kind of go, okay, I put that. Away. Now, how do I kind of add value? And where's their, where's their white space? And, and there's some discomfort in that. It's actually also freeing because no one's done that before. Yep. And I've liked being, you know, first CMO at Uber. Many of the jobs at Coke were the first time somebody had those jobs. And I, mm. I appreciated that That's because amazing yeah, think, I, was, right? I think I can only count on my hand one or two of my 10 jobs at Coke that I maybe was less than 10 jobs, eight jobs at yeah. Coke mm -hmm. that someone had before me. And it's very, very freeing mm -hmm. to, to do that and not have to walk in someone's shoes, but actually mm -hmm. kind of create the new shoes, if you would. Mm -hmm. But there is a discomfort you have to thrive in. And um, it makes objectives hard, right? It makes explaining what you do hard. And if you just yeah. put it in the context of value, it mm -hmm. tends to it tends to work. Mm -hmm. uh, funny, you mentioned uh, you called me an entrepreneur and uh, and explaining what you do. And I always say that uh, I grew I went to college same time as you. So when you know at, when I was in the professional field, I never used the word entrepreneur because back then it used to mean loser, can't get job. Right. Like, <laughs> right. And now look at you. You're, now you're got your little Julia Roberts moment. I know now. Yeah. Now it's like entrepreneur means something. Uh, entrepreneur yeah. meant uh, didn't mean a good thing back then. Right. Right. It was placeholder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someday we'll get a job. Exactly. He's just he can't figure it out yet. Yeah. What do you what do you think your the lessons that you tried to take from when you uh, one, what convinced you to leave Coke after yeah. this amazing a ride? And then two, like, what were the lessons? What were the things that you learned the hard way that you were trying to take to Uber and to whatever you did next? Yeah. So between, you know, Beam and the move out of Coke was hard because mm -hmm. I never saw myself leaving. I had to write the CV as the headhunters calling. I'd never even really taken the calls before. My husband also worked there. So we together were like 43 what? years at Coke. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. That was, that was, I mean, I guess in a, in a company as yeah. big as Coke, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, we met living in France. He's Dutch. Um, we were both expats in France together. Mm -hmm. um, we got married. And by the way, this is the funniest part. People who worked with us at Coke always laugh. We were in offices next to each other for a while at Coke, like literally like <laughs> out my door and into his. Um, and so I never took his last name just because it was like, that would have been triply weird. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. right, like, oh, the Hendricksons are in a meeting. I'm like, no, no, Rebecca's in a meeting and Derek's yep. in a meeting. And so we, um, but anyway, it, it was really a big decision because in a way it was the end of an era for our family at Coke, right? And that was mm. hard. Yeah. Um, so part of it was wow. just good time to go. Mm -hmm. It was, um, we kind of both really been there a, a long time. I knew and I, I always felt Coke was sincere and like, you know, you're on this path to, maybe, to be our CMO, one of, there's, but there was mm -hmm. a few of us, right? And there's yeah, no guarantee. Yeah. And to have the opportunity to go to a great company like Beam with an incredible CEO, I was just so mm -hmm. drawn to what he was doing and the opportunity to take, they had big brands, you know, you mentioned some of them, they had craft brands, they had mm. families, they had stories, they have long legacies and short legacies. 
And I also had the chance to manage R&D, which is so interesting in spirits. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. so that. interesting because you really are working on, like you're really imagining where trends are going. What are people gonna be drinking? Wow. What do we need to be making? What mash bills? How do we need to think about this? What types of, it was just wonderful to, to get that experience. And I would have never gotten that at, at Coke. And so to, to really have that end-to-end -end experience was so special. And so when you asked like, what did I bring with me? You know, I left for the first time a place where marketing was the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. That was Coke. Yep. And then when you go to a spirits company, at least being then was heavily sales oriented, sales and commercial. Okay. Okay. That sounds Uber, familiar. Yeah, right? really yep. And then Uber would be marketing really wasn't in the universe, right? At all. Right. It was, <laughs> and so it was like Beam helped me kind of go, okay, recenter, realizing, yeah. you know, not every company is going to declare marketing as their most important capability, mm -hmm. but in a company like Beam, you're leaving value on the table. If you don't recognize the potential of these brands through the stories, the archives. That was something I learned at Coke was our past helps direct the stories we can tell later on. That's where our credibility comes from. Okay. We have this unbelievable archives department at Coke that I just thrived with. And because it was, it chronicled the stories and and it kept you honest at the brand's DNA. And you just had to find ways to, yeah. you know, keep that brand very timely for today. You know, brands are timely and timeless. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was key for, for us. And I kind of took that with me to Beam of, what can we dig into? How can we dig more into these families? But then very much contextualize them in the world we're at now. You know, fast forward though, Uber required the best of all of that because Coke believed it was a marketing company and it stayed at the forefront of marketing. Mm -hmm. And so we were a pretty modern marketing company by what we needed to be, right? We weren't real-time marketing in the same way that you guys are. Yeah. in the optimization, but we could, you know, real time social for sure, but not real time sales the mm -hmm. way you all are optimizing all the time. Fast forward to Beam and you you kind of go back a bit and part of the job there was modernizing marketing, mm -hmm. bringing it up to, but, but again, fit for purpose here, like, right? Like what does that need to look like in a business that's 220 years old? And what, what, what does that mean for that business? What does that mm -hmm. tech stack look like? It's very different yep. than what Uber needs to do, what it needs mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to Uber, it required all of that but in reverse order. So I walk into the world's most modern company, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Never had a CMO, never had a marketer in the leadership team. I screech wow. in, you know, the last, <laughs> last man, you know, last Something seat. tells me you could screech in, no problem. I did screech in. And, um, and the job there was like um, a, taking the best of what you've learned along the way, mm -hmm. but very, very carefully ensuring that it doesn't sound like you're trying to make one of the world's most important companies of the 21st century sound like a CPG. Yep. And I really loved that tension. I, I, I wanted, that it was so important to me that, that I didn't do that. And, and Beam mm -hmm. helped me break some of that because first Beam had to, I had to stop talking about Coke, right? Like I got that yep. feedback out of the gate, 22 years somewhere, you're talking about Coke too much, shut up. And they kind of told me that my great <laughs> boss at Beam was like, stop with the Coke stories. I'm yeah. like, okay, but it is in fairness, it's all I've ever worked at. Yeah. And, um, and so, Part of what I like about my current situation so much is variety. You have and, new stories. Yeah, exactly. I can tell new stories now, but just having this variety now that I'm exposed to. And so it was a, it was really this opportunity to take the idea of timely and timeless because mm. Uber was super timely, but it hadn't determined what its timeless message was yet. Mm. It hadn't really determined who it was, right? So it needed yeah. meaning. Um, it had incredible data, but probably lacked consumer insight the way I knew how to look for it. Mm -hmm. So we did focus groups and in-home surveys and things that just weren't part of what they did, right? It just wasn't, it, in, yeah. you know, it wasn't what got them there. And yeah. um, we just, so we just did different things, but we did them very much, you know, in my head, I knew how to do this, but I just tried to put it in words and language mm -hmm. um, that felt right for the context I was in. It's interesting. I, I am kind of obsessed right now about like, what's the difference between a brand and an icon? And mm -hmm. so I'm thinking a lot about that. And it yeah. seems like, you know, Uber, and you mentioned like this Google and, and Apple and these things taking over parts of our life. Like in some ways like Uber to me is like more of an icon than a brand. Like you may have come from brands, but like brands to me represent like a product, a service, mm -hmm. a thing, you know, like a feeling. And then the icons are like, represent like a cultural shift, right? Like something like bigger. Right. Like to me, an example of a, an icon versus a brand is like, uh, and I just saw this the other day, I was like, oh, Harley Davidson's like an icon, right? Because like it represented this cultural shift, like everything, even black yeah. on black, I'm wearing black and black drift here. This is in some ways, you know, 
brought on by this kind of cultural shift that Harley kind of represents, even if you don't never rode a Harley Davidson, never used that product, never even would consider it. Like there's a difference between those two. Have you ever thought, I thought about, about this? Yeah. Well, I, I don't think I articulated it as good <laughs> as you actually, but it's so interesting. You bring up icon and we can talk about icons, products mm -hmm. and brands, right? So, yeah. and in an iconic way, like it's iconic. It's a navigation tool, right? Like um, yeah. Uber was certainly iconic in disrupting mm -hmm. how we move around. Mm -hmm. I think though, I would love to say like, if it was iconic for something else too, maybe yeah. progress yeah. or, but, but mm -hmm. I don't think the world's giving it that yet. No, right? Not yet. Right? So it's like, it's certainly iconic in the sense that, that you will always remember Mm -hmm. you know, your first Uber ride, presumably, just like you mm -hmm. remember your first Coke and you remember where you were. Many people in interviews will remember that baseball game or where they were yeah. less so now, but certainly for a long time, that was an important indicator for us. And so I think in the sense of icons, they absolutely represent something that's mm -hmm. in a class all its own. But I think it can be, you know, if Muhammad Ali was an icon of what yeah. he, he was an icon of boxing, but he mm -hmm. was also an icon of you know, other freedoms, right? And and I think that's where I think there's a difference. I don't think Uber's gotten all the way to the other no, icon yet. Not yet. It's what certainly the icons right in its category. Is Tesla. Tesla seems like it can, like it's becoming an icon, right? Because it represents a lot more than just a car, electric, whatever. It really has, it feels like it's representing something larger, this shit. Yes. I don't I know think, if it's no, I do. I think you're right on that, on that one too. Part mm -hmm. of that is because he does things that are bigger than the car. Yeah. Right. He always kind of takes you to other places, which is like, he, so he's trying to stand for more. He's really, really trying to change the world. Yeah. And he's trying and he's created Tesla means more than a car now. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's a mindset almost. And I think that's where the icon piece. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think Uber, Uber has the potential for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. You know, and the, the product brand icon conversation is so interesting. <laughs> it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you and the business you're in so get it. Is, and your teams get it. Like just in the time I was kind of preparing for this and the other conversation mm -hmm. I had, I'm so impressed with how the, your teams really understand what business they're in, who they serve, what they want to stand for, the way they treat people. It's very nice. You know, <laughs> Thank very you. Nice. The, yeah, it's the true. The only uh, observation, the only thing that we knew kind of starting the business and, and what we're doing now and kind of reinforces that there is no other way. I think I just think we're in a different part of the cycle right now. Like. The, the, that is the only path forward, I think, right? Just like building a brand was at some point with CPGs, demand gen was for a certain era. Like, I think we're in this new era that we're still all trying to define, like, I don't think there's another way, right? Because there's too many alternatives, too much choice, there's That's too right. much everything. Like, That's right. Yeah, so. Yeah, it's and there's too much choice, and I love that you know that, mm -hmm. because it's not just choice, it's sensitivity yeah. of many types. We actually okay. did a study once at Coke, mm -hmm. where we actually studied brand love. And so brand love technically defined as, you know, loyalty beyond reason. And I didn't mm -hmm. come up with that. Uh, um, one of the icons in advertising did, but mm -hmm. we studied actually countries that had higher brand. We actually had a brand love score. So we studied countries. A brand love score? We did a brand love score. A score, score. Score, yeah. And so, um, and we had, we looked at all of the countries around the world. And we looked at like which countries had higher brand love than others. Mm -hmm. And we looked at, correlated that with sales. And we, so we made the argument for how important brand love was is point one. Wow, that's NPS to the next level. To the next right. level, yes. Yeah. And, um, and it was really important because it helped us, you know, tell these stories to bottlers. It helped us ensure the whole system could kind of understand how important it was to build brand love. Mm -hmm. But then we also looked at um, what brand love gives you. It gives you, you know, breaks a tie. It gives you air cover when you screw up, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and you see lots of examples of brands that don't have that air cover. And they're like, okay, now what? It uh, reduces price sensitivity, right? There's just so many things that it, it gives you. Mm -hmm. And um, it, that's like the brand halo that people would talk yeah, about. Right? Yes, exactly. It's the brand mm -hmm. halo. And, and it, it, it's so, so important. And it's so often overlooked and, and very often overlooked. And I, uh, I struggle sometimes with some of the companies that I advise because today's marketing tools, the 21st century tools that we are in a luxurious position of having mm -hmm. can measure a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, but. There's, they still can't measure everything. And sometimes it's this part we're talking about mm -hmm. 
that we get frustrated. It's like we shine a light on what we can't measure and therefore it's bad. I'm like, no, actually, it's really, really good. <laughs> really good. Really Thank really you for good. saying that. It's yeah. like maybe the most valuable part of everything in here, but it yeah. just doesn't pay you back in the same way these other things do. It doesn't pay you back today, in this yeah. minute, right now, um, but it will pay you back exponentially. I think that's been, uh, I harp on this so much. I rant on this so much. And I, uh, and it's so fundamental to everything that we do. I say like, you know, like marketers today, and I mean mostly digital marketers, right? You know, like are obsessed with things that are perfectly measurable, perfectly scalable, but like, and then run away from things that are, like you said, hard to measure, you know, maybe subscale, like whatever, but like all the opportunities actually there, yes. right? Like all the opportunities there in the immeasurable, the stuff that's hard to measure, like there is very little opportunity left in, you know, these perfectly scalable, perfectly measurable things because everyone is there. All the noise is there. It's That's been like, right. All the arbitrage has been taken out of those systems. Like it's right. only here. And it's like, it, it just like baffles me. Like why they all, everyone wants to focus on this stuff when all the real stuff is right here. And they would always ask me, sorry for my rants, but like this is my uh, thing I love talking about. Just, they would always ask me like, you know, these activities that we would do and these uh, kind of marketing and brand building things that we would do, they were like, how do you know it works? Because you can't measure and, a, and yeah. I'm like, because we literally, literally the person that we're marketing to, the customer, the brand told me. And yes. they told me, they told, like I, like this, just like told me, either they did it in, you know, uh, video, text, you know, social, or even face to face. And then it was, you know, it'd be funny. And then we'd have this whole conversation with groups of them. And then they, we would get to the end and they would say, so how do you know it's working? I'm like, what? <laughs> this is lunacy. Because they told me, like, we have to, because it doesn't exist in Google Analytics does not mean that it doesn't, That's it's right. not working. You but know, it's so crazy. amazing that you know that. And, and the idea that everybody can chase those same analytics, yes. the only thing you have left is this. Yeah. Like the only thing you have left to differentiate is your voice, your personality, what you stand for, the values, mm -hmm. the purpose you were built on, all of that. That's the only thing we can give consumers that gives them any real choice left. Yeah. The rest is in the back end and <laughs> we can all optimize it. And to your point, it's like it's like a really efficient factory, right? It, mm -hmm. We can't get much more efficient back here, nope. but, right? And so like we have to play with the only variable that's truly a variable, it's a crazy. true I variable. How do you choose companies now to like advise them to work with yeah. like and and ones that hopefully will get what you're saying versus not? Yeah, so I, I kind of advise in three different pillars. One is through McKinsey and yep. with them, they get this amazing client base and I feel very lucky to get brought into some of those incredible conversations trying to solve huge problems. Mm. I mean, you don't, I don't choose them as much. So I kind of, I usually take the assignments as they come most often. They're always very high quality clients. The yep. ones where I truly choose are really try to point my energy and my efforts to companies that are breaking conventions from the 20th century. So a lot of that, sometimes it. that means- You're food. a troublemaker, I love it. Yeah, a bit, like <laughs> better food. I really, my, mm -hmm. my husband's put his whole rest of his career now into really disrupting the food system and looking at food waste and reducing um, footprints and things. And um, so looking at better food, better beverages, like mm -hmm. in all aspects of that, right? They, they don't always have to be even perfectly healthy. I'm not, you know, I'm on the board of a wine um, company, but it's really yeah. staying close to the source, getting mm -hmm. to know the maker, how it's sustainably sourced, how we're doing it, like things that are just really trying to go about being better. I'm um, having conversations story, with companies. In other words, going yeah. back to work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, having, you know, looking at things like spaces that are companies that are really trying to help the world in terms of mental health, like mm -hmm. stigmas that we had in the 20s, infertility. Um, I love those companies that uh, plant-based, these are, I just think, you know, if I look back on my own career and go, okay, I had this chance to learn from some of the world's biggest icons, mm -hmm. um, but now how can I help companies kind of get on a, a, get on a path that takes and short circuits of my 20, 30 years of experience, it just mm -hmm. helps them do this. So we sit down and I talk with CEOs and we spend hours working on missions and visions mm -hmm. and some just get it faster than others but i find they all get it it's just a patience question <laughs> um really they do, do you it, wear them down uh i don't know i think a few would tell me i'm, I'm i i i i think the I mission and vision is maybe the hardest conversation you will ever have mm -hmm. it's like oh, it, and i so stick with it painful so painful but i'm like just let's stick with this because it will pay you back the clarity it will give you <sighs> it'll help you choose products you will make or you won't make It'll Rebecca, help I spend you. It's so much time in pain in this area yes. and I'm obsessed with it. And it's still, I, I try to explain it to people. It's just like, it is painful. It will always be painful. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. It is pain. It is. 
it, and it's easier to not do it. It's like yes. it's like avoiding a hard conversation. Totally. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the same idea. And I'm like, on this one though, this is it's it's freeing. It mm -hmm. is gonna give you so much freedom if you can go, this is our mission, this is our vision for the brand, yep. this brand, you know, how it all works together, it's it's very freeing. And I've been lucky to have some really interesting conversations with a lot of cool CEOs doing cool things in this space and um, and again, you're not using fancy language. You don't have. You're yep. not using fancy research techniques yep. like we would use to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, we will have conversations. We'll we'll simplify those. Let's talk about archetypes, right? Like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. my goodness! All right, don't start that because I'm going to yeah. go. Yeah, this conversation will never end. I'm yeah, I, I mean, I love like it's really true. They are they are timeless. It's unbelievable. Yes. Right. Yes. Like and and in a way, brands are archetypes for us. Like think Absolutely. about like they help us navigate around and 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 that's why these archetypes are so helpful to us and really yeah. helpful for global brands. Mm -hmm. really helpful because you can take that idea and you just have to think about like what's a hero in Japan relative to a hero uh, in the US and and just such an easy powerful tool to use and, and, and any company can use it it's kind of free right oh my god I love Rebecca Messina oh well you're very kind absolutely uh, I always uh, I would always say like before starting Drift like my background is engineering technology I didn't know and I built stuff for marketers my whole career so like been around them but I didn't understand marketing I mean I don't know if I still do but like but so I started to understand it because my brain is logical, right? It's okay. the opposite. It's like I don't yeah. understand the emotional part. And so like to do it, I went back in time and I started to study like old school copywriting, human decision wow. making, archetypes, storytelling, you know, like everything from, you know, the hero's journey to like, yeah. you know, all the different archetypes, mm -hmm. what they mean. And then once I understood it from and cognitive biases and all these kind of things, like once I understood like those elements, the, in other words, the people, element, you know, the storytelling, why people make decisions the way they do, how they build, then I finally could understand to some level marketing. And it, it, and it's funny, I, all I talk about now is this. So most people think that I'm a marketer. I'm like, I'm not, you really are I'm amazing. A marketer. And you know what I'm hearing in you two things that is mm -hmm. so fascinating. One, I'm now connecting you to some of the other entrepreneurs that I'm talking to. And I'm realizing there's something about you guys that is so special that I don't have the same sauce. Mm -hmm. But you guys deconstruct things. Yes, to learn them. Um, and that's that engineering maybe in you. And that's a yes. side note tangent, but that's beside the way. Um, the other thing I was going to say was oh. it's the brand love piece and the building brands and the way you learned it. The other thing that if you had your own lock on sort of copywriting and human decision making, yeah. mine was we went at Coke and we studied um, how people fall in love. So I actually wow. got love wow. experts. Yeah. And um, Pepper, Pepper Schwartz was her name. She's, mm -hmm. I think she's still probably... I think she's on today's show every year at thanks or Valentine's Day, but she's really an expert on how people fall in love. And what is so interesting is we were able to connect how people fall in love with mm -hmm. how people fall in love with brands. And the similarities are amazing. It would be and the same, right? Because we're same. just humans. So. That's right. And we're looking for consistency, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And then we can break the tie. If you screw up, reduce sensitivity as I love you. Mm -hmm. But only as I love you can you make more, you know, um, are you good looking in the beginning matters? What are your values? It's all <laughs> the same. It's, and all the it's same. so amazing. And she was this unlock for the, those of us that were working on this project because it was just like, oh, my gosh, if you just keep that in mind. And because we all have had relationships, whatever they're with, you're, you know, it's like you can't say you love me if you don't actually call me. <laughs> Brands should actions need to be louder than words, right? Like yeah. everything about a relationship can hold true in how you build brands. I'm like, forget going to school on brands. Just learn, just think about relationships and that really, it helps. Oh, absolutely. That's why from the very beginning of the conversation, like it's about people. Marketing is about people. And because yeah. I always say like study the people stuff with relation, you know, like yeah. you said, relationships, whether it's human decision making, all these kind of like technical things, social psychology, like all that kind of stuff. Study that because that's the only thing that's real. That's the only thing that has not changed, will not change. And, you know, all this other stuff that we study is not that useful in terms of marketing because that's those are just mechanics right but the thing that does and those things will always change because yep. of technology the thing that never changes is what people need from an emotional level that's and right. a connection level and a relationship level and that's what we should study as marketers i agree and actually it's now it's all that's left that maybe a machine uh, can't yes. do for us Amen. right mm -hmm. and and uh, and even there there's some things they can do in terms of some patterns there's a lot it can do of course but mm -hmm. i couldn't agree with you more it is it's all that's left, and I think those are the those are going to be the brands that have the biggest mark in this in this century for sure, is those that have 
used all the greatest tools and technology of the 21st century, but kept empathy. Yeah. You know, and I think I really do think Google does an amazing job with that. I think yes. about a brand that doesn't really need to tell any stories about, no. you know, these beautiful stories that tell us sometimes you've seen them. Mm -hmm. And I think is it has it, it doesn't need to do that, but it it does that for us to keep in mind that they do stand for something bigger than a search mm -hmm. bar. Mm, right. I love that. And that they at, that actually you're searching for meaning very often mm -hmm. when you're using them. And it kind of reminds us of that meaning that they that they stand for. And I, I, I it's, it's just if you're fascinating that you you inherently knew this. Um, you didn't go uh, to the school because I have no emotions, for, Rebecca. So I, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. You wouldn't you wouldn't know this if you didn't. <laughs> Maybe deep down deep, like in some dark. We've got to dig them up. Corner. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. This has been a fascinating conversation. You spend much, most time on social media. Can people reach you? Yeah, they can. I'm on Twitter. I'm lousy on Instagram. Maybe it's because I'm a terrible picture taker and I'm intimidated. <laughs> um, so every once in a while, if I get a good one, I throw it up there. But yes, yeah. I'm a, and uh, lightly Facebook, but mostly LinkedIn and Twitter is where I'm at. Oh, so you have to find Rebecca Messina. We're going to have links in the show notes. This was an amazing conversation. I could waste her day away with many uh, rants and conversations. Here. Well, I'm honored to talk to you. You are just amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. And Rebecca, this is the Galaxy's only six-star rated podcast. Uh, you know how you can leave five-star yeah. ratings yeah. for things? Our audience leaves six stars. So they leave five stars, and then they go into the description and leave an extra star. Oh, but no, I'm going to be super so disappointed good. if we don't get seven. <laughs> <laughs> it is seven now. <laughs> Rebecca Mestina has put this up to seven star exactly. only podcast. Yeah, exactly. So leave seven stars, leave a comment for Rebecca, and please follow along with her on social media. This has been an amazing episode. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. Thank you for so much. All right. Take care, Dave.